Hello. Um, last year marked the 175th anniversary of the start of the Great Famine in Ireland. And we know this started in 1845 and continued to devastate the country until 1852. The disaster was caused by the near annual destruction of the potato crop as a result of blight. And this was amongst a population that solely relied on the tubers of the, the potatoes for their sustenance. Starvation and associated disease caused chaos throughout Ireland. And we can see this in the, social, the census returns of 1841 and 1851, which show that the population had reduced from 8.2 to 6.5 million in a decade. This 19.8% decrease um, is due to the people who died or who were forced to emigrate to survive. So to commemorate the Great Famine, the Centre for Community Archaeology at Queen's had planned two projects in 2020. So the first of these was working with the, the Glens of Antrim Potatoes and the Belfast Hills Partnership. And we had planned to have a community based project that would involve, you know, digging uh, the cultivation ridges or lazy beds and planting lumper potatoes, which are um, particularly associated with this period. But the COVID-19 pandemic meant that we, we, we had to abandon the community aspect of this. But um, Brian Sloan from the CCA, he basically planted the, the lumpers in his back garden. And then via our QUB um, Archaeology at Queen's Facebook site, he was able to document you know, the growth of these potatoes from the tiniest shoots up until when he was feasting on them for his dinner. Our second project then um, was supported by the Queen's um, Engaged Research Fund, and the plan was to undertake an excavation at a famine road in County Fermanagh, again in summer 2020. And again, these plans had to be abandoned because of the pandemic, but thankfully last summer, summer 2021, we were able to get out and undertake our excavation. And this involved staff, students and volunteers working um, on a stretch of, of the flush of this um, road, which you can see in this picture here, at Drumcurran in Bow for one week over August. Now, famine roads are a very striking aspect um, of the historic landscape across Ireland, but they've largely escaped archaeological attention, you know, even though we know they're directly linked to the Great Famine. They're called a whole range of different names, so things like meal roads, broad roads, bracken, which is porridge roads, um, lines or new lines. Um, we know that the public works schemes in Fermanagh took place between you know, October 1846 and June 1847. And this was basically uh, the British government's response to the crisis in Ireland. They um, devised these public work schemes, um, basically where the poor could then obtain you know, either payment or food in return for, for their labour. Now, undertaken during a terrible winter, the schemes really did cause more harm than good, you know, on a population that was already very desperate because of the catastrophe. And by spring 1847, the scheme was, was abandoned as a failure by the Whig government in London. And it was then replaced by a network of soup kitchens, which were funded by local taxation. Now, the roads that had been started were not always completed, and many of them were abandoned in an unfinished state. So this is the case for our our road here at Drumacurran, which just ends um, quite abruptly in a field. Now, we're fortunate that British parliamentary papers exist, which give very detailed instructions to the engineers, you know, charged with con overseeing construction of these roads. And there's also this, this diagram here, which um, again gives very precise details. So there were two types of roads. Um, a larger road, which you can see at the top, could be uh, 24 feet in width with a footpath or they could be 21 feet in width with no footpath. Um, they were to have little fences on either side, um, which were to be three feet, and three feet six inches in height. And then um, at beyond the fences, there was to be a drain, which again was um, three feet six inches in, de in depth. Beneath the roads, there were to be um, cross pipes. And then the foundation layer of the road was to be made of clay or sand, and it was to be free from stones and vegetable earth. Um, so this was basically the platform and then the stone of the road would have been put across the top of this um, with gaps being filled in with what they called, you know, blinding, which was sand or gravel. So in addition to the excavation, our project sought to map the roads in two of the baronies within southwest Fermanagh that had been most heavily affected by the crisis. 
So these were um, Mahraboy, which includes the village of Derigonley, and the Barony of Clanolly, which includes the Bow region. So initial historical research was undertaken by Dr Jill Almond, and this identified 34 public work schemes belonging to this period, and 17 of these were located in Clanolly and a further 17 were in Mahraboy, although four of the latter didn't get their funding. And in our project, we were able to locate 26 of these on the modern landscape. So the engineer for Fermanagh was um, Roderick Gray from Enniskillen, and he was the county surveyor from 1834 to 1876. And some of the roads that he oversaw construction of, you know, are, they're still in use today. So, for example, Road M5, you can see a photograph of it. So this is a road just outside the village of Derry Gonley. Um, and it basically runs between the townlands of Achaheran and Derry Very Moor. Um, other roads like C12 that you can see down at the bottom of the map are still in use as agricultural lanes. But some were completely abandoned. So this includes road C6, which is in the middle of the map. And this is known locally as the line and it ran for 1.38 uh, miles across five townlands. Um, and a surviving section of the road is still located in Drumacur in Townland, um, right beside Flush Bridge. And this is where we focused our excavation. So the civil parish of Bow, it's divided between the baronies of Maharaboy and Clanolly. And as I said, it was particularly severely affected by the Great Famine, with um, about 32% of its population vanishing between 1841 and 1851. Now, we know that the um, relief schemes in Fermanagh commenced on the 15th of October 1846, but the work didn't begin immediately and we're not entirely sure of the precise date when the line, which is um, scheme number six or RC6 road, um, commenced. But we do have some information from the documentary sources that enable us to get you know, a rough timeline. Um, we know that a sum of £400 had been requested from the Treasury by the Extraordinary Presentment Sessions for Clanolly on the 2nd of October 1846. Um, and this was towards making a new line of road from Enniskillen to Holywell between the Barony boundary at Clochian Bridge and the Crossroads in Acre. So that's basically Bow Crossroads. Um, we know as well that the request was approved by the Treasury on the 28th of October 1846. But we think it's probable that it didn't commence until the week ending um, the 14th of November 1846. And this is because there was a major increase in the number of labourers employed across the county. And it rose from 349 to 1369 during that week. Um, thereafter, the figures rose weekly until the middle of January 1847, when there were um, 7,576 labourers employed in public works in Fermanagh and 875 of these worked in Clanolly. Um, we know as well that there was a second presentment sessions for Clanolly on the 8th of March um, 1847 and that a further £500 was requested for scheme number six. So um, £150 of this was released on the 30th of March 1847 and then a further 350 was released on the 22nd of May 1847. So basically, the construction of the, the line at Drumacurin, you know, amounted, it cost £900. Um, we don't know when the scheme actually came to an end, but the fact that you've got additional money being allocated, you know, quite late in May, it may suggest that the line remained active until the termination of all public works in Fermanagh um, in the week ending the 19th of June, 1847. So the line is marked on um, second second and third edition ordnance survey maps um, and you can see it's um, it's got quite large ditches in certain stretches of the road that, that flank it um, so these would be in sort of the townlands of Drumherk Upper and Drumboy and this is a photograph then of a stretch of the road at Drumherk Upper and you can see the large ditches on either side so this stretch of the road is now relatively inaccessible because it's in forestry um, and these, these larger ditches were probably designed to um, remove water away from the road and try to sort of direct it into streams feeding into the, the river sillies. Um, the sort of the presence of the road on these maps also shows us that it shadowed the pre-existing um, road that's marked on the first edition map. 
So this road was, was quite hilly in nature and possibly they had wanted to replace you know, the, the road that was being used um, with, with our famine road on um, lower ground. But they probably soon realised that flooding from the River Sillies was going to be um, a problem. And that's why, you know, we've got these large ditches at certain stretches. So the specifics of daily work on the public schemes in Fermanagh weren't recorded, but we do know from um, the official documents that the, the, the condition would have been harsh. The labourers would have been expected to work from 6am to 6pm with an hour for dinner, uh, six days a week. The Board of Works stipulated that a roll should be called each morning at 6am and if anyone wasn't present they would lose a quarter of a day's pay. If they hadn't attended by 9am, half half a day's pay was deducted and then anyone who turned who turned up after 9am would have been turned away for the day and not received any payment. A roll was also called then at 6pm and no payment was made to anyone who wasn't present. So in some cases the labourers they may have received food in the morning and at the end of the working day but the wages which would have ranged between you know eight pence and ten pence per day wouldn't have been sufficient to combat the ever rising food prices in the country. Also on top of this, um, the winter that year was really, really harsh. Um, and the first snowfall was reported in Fermanagh in November, 1846, with the freezing weather continuing up until February, 1847. So the first official um, kind of death from starvation on a public work scheme in Fermanagh was reported in the Enniskillen Chronicle on the 22nd of December 1846, although of course there may have been other deaths you know, before this that weren't reported to the papers. So a man called James Rolston um, of the Lowerstown or basically Irvinstown area was found dead in a field near his house. So the newspaper tells us that he had a, a family of six and that he'd walked three quarters of a mile the previous day to the public works at Drum School, which is near the Cash Road and he would have toiled all day in the snow for 10 pence. Um, it also recounts how his family were subsisting on turnips boiled in water and in the inquest found that he had died of fatigue and want of sufficient nourishment. So at the time potatoes would have been selling for 10 pence a stone in the Lowerstown market so that would have been more than three times their usual price. So Rolston's daily income would have bought enough potatoes only for himself and not for the rest of his family so that's probably why they were subsisting on turnips, which were um, cheaper, but only provided about a third of the calories. So after this, this, um, this entry, then there's regular entries in the papers, you know, of people dying on the road schemes from starvation, exhaustion, and also as a result of injuries caused by accidents. So the accounts don't specifically mention the work undertaken at the line at Drumacurin. Um, and the oral tradition we have is quite general. You know, it says that workers died during its construction and that some of the labourers resorted to eating grass. Now that said, the area had an eerie reputation and local historian, Sister Edel Bannon, um, reported a memory from her childhood. Basically that people were, who were walking along the Bow Road um, and the path passing Drumacurin at night would run past the field where the line was located for fear of encountering ghosts. Now we do have to wonder, you know, was this um, coloured by um, a folk memory of what had happened, you know, or been witnessed by the local people in the mid 19th century. So the objective of our fieldwork was to excavate a trench um, measuring one metre by 16 metres across in an upstanding section of the line in Drumacurin. And basically we wanted to investigate the form and nature of the monument at this point. Uh, we also wanted to explore how rigidly uh, the county surveyor, Roderick Gray, um, had worked to the template provided from London, you know, in terms of the dimensions of the road. So you can see um, the location of our trench one. And then a few fields away, we also opened up a, a two metre by one metre trench, um, just, just to sort of, again, check, check our findings from trench one. So a reconnaissance GPR survey was undertaken by Dr. Alistair Ruffle. Um, and Basically, he was investigating the sort of the underlying geology and he'd also we'd, we'd also hoped he might actually be able to identify, you know, a layer of imported stone across the road platform. So his survey identified shallow ditches to either side of the road, um, but it suggested that the platform on the road was clay and that there was no evidence for an imported stone surface because 
we had basically been expected that we expecting that we would remove the topsoil and come straight down onto a layer of stones. But Alistair's survey was actually correct. Um, and the road platform was indeed formed by um, a compacted clay layer and there was no stone added to the upper surface. And as you can see from the photo at the bottom, this was also the case then for trench two. So the clay platform, which is C106 in trench one, it proved to have a maximum thickness of 60 centimetres. It was 11 metres or 36 feet wide and it was set onto the original clay surface in the field. So given that the platform was designed to support a road with um, a stone surface, it's clear that either of the government's regulated roads, the 21 feet or the 24 feet roads, could have been placed on this fitting. And the GPR survey was also correct in identifying um, drainage channels along either side of the road. But we know that these were modern drains laid down by um, the landowner Sean McLaughlin in the 80s. So while we knew that the line had never been completed because it did end abruptly in the field, we were surprised to discover that the scheme hadn't progressed to the point where the stone surface had been laid down. Because clearly a significant amount of effort had been invested in the road. You know, there was £900 of public money. Its to full extent had been marked out. You know, deep ditches had been excavated along certain sections. And then the clay platform had been laid down. But because there was no stone surface, it could never have been a functioning road. And the older road then continued as the main route from, um, you know, Bow Cross Roads to Clotten Bridge, as it does to this day. Now, we found absolutely no artefacts during the excavation, and we considered this to be very unusual because generally we always find something when we excavate. But we think this may be um, a reflection of the conditions during the famine when the poor people um, working on these roads would have had practically nothing. So the goal from the very outset was to place the, 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 the project at the line in the heart of the local community in Bow and to raise awareness of the existence of the monument. So we were really delighted with the, the uh, you know, the local interest um, in the project and we had a st steady stream of people visiting the site and we had lots of volunteers working alongside the archaeologists. Um, the project also received great promotion from the Fermanagh Herald um, before, during and after the fieldwork. An interdenominational service of remembrance and an open evening was held on Thursday the 26th of August um, and this was attended by about 70 people. It was officiated by um, Sister Del Bannon, Father Seamus Quinn and Reverend Samson Ajuka. And I've included some video clips from the end of the, from the service at the very end of my talk, just, just so you can get a sense of the poignancy of the event. So beyond the Bow community, we hope that the forthcoming inclusion of the excavation in BBC's Digging for Britain will further highlight the project to a wide audience because the story of the line is simultaneously local and national, because it's also the story of the Great Famine across Ireland. So famine roads often survive today as grassed over scars on the modern landscape, and their purpose is only dimly remembered by modern society. But each one serves as a reminder of the events of 175 years ago that forever changed Ireland, culturally, socially and economically. Their importance as monuments of that era does need to be better recognised and promoted. And we are really delighted to report that the Historic Environment Division has agreed that the line will be the first famine road to be included within the Northern Ireland Sites and Monument record. So there's a whole range of people to be thanked because obviously a project like this is very much um, a team project, involves lots of, of, of different people. But I just want to say we're particularly grateful to um, Sean McLaughlin and his family for permitting us to excavate on his land and for the, the generous hospitality um, that the people of Bow showed us while we were undertaking our work. digging out the hills, removing stones and filling in the hollows. There would be six or eight men loosening the earth, four filling barrows with the stuff and four men wheeling. 
two men worked at each barrow, and they took it in turns to shovel and wheel. They had to make a double run of 20, 24 or 30 yards and back. It was knacky work, and a man had to be very careful. He had to run down a nine-inch plank with his full barrow to the tip head, tip out the stuff, and turn back. If he was not careful, and knacky, he might topple his barrow over and maybe fall after it himself. The tip head was the worst part. The whip up, as they called the overseer, watched them all the time while he walked around quack, cracking his whip. If a man showed any slackness or weakness at all, he was knocked off at once. There was always plenty of men waiting around watching for the chance to get work. There might be a hundred men sitting on the boundary to see if any man would drop out. If the laborer was not able to do a certain amount of work every day, he was knocked out of employment. The only rest during the day was the dinner hour. Before and after that, it was back-breaking heavy labor all the time. And that's from the National Folklore Commission for West Mead. It is sheer folly to suppose that the operations of the Board of Work can remedy the existing evil or lead to a better state of things. People in the employment of this board are on the very verge of starvation, even now, whilst being engaged. What therefore must be their condition when the winter sets in with all its dreadful accompaniments of frost, rain and snow? The Enniskillen Chronicle, the 12th of November, 1846.